Good morning, everyone. Today, I'll be with our Atlanta location, but with all that's happening in Israel, I just want to update our entire Chapel Hill Church family on these critical events, and then we're going to pray. As you know, we unapologetically stand with Israel. God said in Genesis 12, 3, speaking of Israel, I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse those who curse you. The images and the stories that are coming from Israel are heartbreaking. The militant Palestinian group, the terrorist group Hamas, has unleashed unspeakable evil on innocent Israeli civilians. The name Hamas, in fact, in the Hebrew means violence, evil, destruction. Hamas is not a military. They are not freedom fighters, but they are vile terrorists. In the words of U.S. Secretary of Defense General Austin, they have taken ISIS to another level of evil. And so it's important to have biblical and moral clarity. I said biblical and moral clarity regarding what has happened in Israel these past eight days. Now, now most of you probably know that early last Saturday, Hamas launched a highly coordinated attack on Israel from Gaza. Thousands of rockets rained on Israel from multiple directions. And Hamas gunmen literally went home to home, door to door in southern Israel, murdering innocent people raping women, looking for the young and elderly, and yes, killing children. And it's been reported even 40 infant babies were killed, some in gruesome fashion. It was nothing short of barbaric, pure evil. They also killed and kidnapped dozens of young people at a music festival. And as of yesterday, Hamas militants have killed at least 1,300 people inside of Israel. The United States State Department has announced that at least 27 U.S. citizens were also killed and several more were taken hostage. Another 3,000 plus Israelis have been wounded. And it's been reported that the last time this many Jewish people were killed in one day was during the Holocaust. Now this terror group has also taken approximately 150 hostages and have threatened to kill them. Now remember, the stated aim of Hamas has always been the complete destruction of Israel. The language in its charter refers to the obliteration of Israel by the forces of Islam. That's their goal. While on the other hand, Israel has sought peace time and time again. But here we are. And President Biden has condemned the terrorist attacks as pure, unadulterated evil. He said, like every nation in the world, Israel has the right to respond and indeed has a duty to respond to these vicious attacks. The next phase of Israel's defense is a ground invasion with the IDF entering Gaza, going street by street to root out the terror group, which is the most dangerous of all warfare. So we need to pray for them. Hamas has embedded its fighters in civilian areas and they strategically and cowardly hide their munitions in mosques and hospitals and schools, even though they know this will likely result in the deaths of civilians. This is part of the evil of Hamas. They use their own people as human shields. Israel, on the other hand, they drop leaflets from military planes in advance of air attacks telling, warning the Palestinian people to move out of the way because of their respect for human life. Now, no, no other military in the world announces in advance where they will attack to avoid the loss of human life. Yet at the same time, Hamas tells their people to ignore the warnings and they put innocent people in harm's way. Israel is responding to these brutal attacks as they should, just as America would and did when we were viciously attacked on 9-11. Please know this. Know that Iran is watching. Everyone knows that Hamas is a proxy for Iran, and Iran has been supplying and training Hamas for years. The terror group Hezbollah to the north in Lebanon is also a proxy for Iran, which means Israel has enemies on almost all sides, including Syria. When we've been in Israel, I think one of the most sobering things to comprehend is how the Jewish people live only a few miles away from neighbors who indiscriminately fire rockets into their communities with an intent to kill and destroy. It, it's anti-Semitism at its worst. And for those who study in, study in time Bible prophecy, these are not surprising events. So keep your eyes on Israel as they are God's timepiece for end time events. 
So while we stand with Israel, we also know that there will be devastating casualties on every side of the conflict. Yet please hear me. Every human life, Israeli and Palestinian, every life matters to God. And our prayers should reflect that truth. As I close, I want to remind you that this is a book about Jewish people. This book is a book of hope. It's about God's journey with Israel and his covenants, his covenants with Israel, his covenants of land, and a covenant that was cut with the blood of his own son, that you and I and our families and the entire world might be saved. It's the message of the gospel. We are Christians because of the Jewish people. Listen, Christianity would not even exist if it were not for the Jewish people. The prophets were Jewish. The apostles were Jewish young men. Jesus' mother was a Jewish virgin. Joseph was a first century Jewish young man. And Jesus was Jewish. And Jewish people gave us the scriptures. And so today we bless Israel and we stand with Israel and we agree with the Apostle Paul's prayer in Romans 10:1 that all of Israel may be saved. So at this moment, at this critical time, I'm asking our church family, would you pray? We must pray. Would you pray with me now? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, in the strong name of your Son, we pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May peace be within her walls, according to Psalm 122. Lord, we pray for the end of bloodshed and violence, especially against civilians. We, we come against Hamas and that spirit of violence. We ask you, O oh Lord, to eradicate the terrorists from Gaza and to stop them now once and for all. We pray in the name of Jesus for families who are grieving and suffering, whose lives have been shattered by the violence. Lord, we pray for the leaders of Israel and as they consider how to respond. Lord, give Prime Minister Netanyahu wisdom, divine wisdom. Give the Israeli Defense Forces wisdom and discernment as they enter Gaza to root out the violence and the evil perpetrators. We pray, Lord, that violence will not spread beyond the borders of Israel. And together, in the name of Jesus, we come against anti-Semitism. We pray against the rise of anti-Semitism around the world and in our own community. Lord Jesus, I pray. I pray that these events would draw more people to faith in God and to salvation through Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, we close this today, and we just pray, Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. And we thank you, O Lord, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah, we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. We love you all. Good morning, everybody. Glad you're at church today. Glad you're joining us in worship and in the word. If you're joining us online, we're so glad that you're here with us. Let us know in the chat where you're watching from. We would love to hear from you. We would love to be able to connect with you. In fact, we've got servant leaders, volunteers right there in the chat who would love to pray with you, encourage you, answer any questions you may have. I know we don't always do this, but let's let our church family online hear us today. Let's let them know how much we appreciate them joining us. We've got over 2,000 people a week that join us right here online from around the country and around our area here. And so we're so glad that you're with us. We're so glad that you're tuned in. I'm excited because, as you know, if you were here last week, we started this brand new message series called The Isness of God. And uh, as we began this series, we, we started to discuss ways that we can learn to experience the character of God. And uh, that's important that we understand the goal here because it's not just about us knowing a bunch of facts and information about God that's going to really help us, but it's, it's a little bit deeper than that. It's about us truly knowing who God is and truly knowing God. And last week I shared this powerful quote from A.W. Tozer. I'll share it again. He said, what you think about God is the most important thing about you. That's powerful. That's, 
For some of us, it may even be sobering. So I want to ask you again today, before I get into today's message, what do you think about God? What do you think, when you think about Him, what do you think about His character? What do you think about His nature? And how does that change you? How does that apply to you and how you live your life? Last week, we talked about the omni-attributes of God. We talked about how our God is omnipotent, and He's omniscient, and He's omnipresent. He's all-powerful. He's all-knowing. He's all-present. And today, we're going to talk about what I think is really the true essence of God. And to get us started, we're going to go to 1 John chapter 4, reading verses 7 through 12. John writes, Dear friends, let us love one another. For love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God. Because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, he writes. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. But if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. The title of today's message is God is love. God is is love. Let's pray. Awesome God, we thank you for this opportunity to come here today to hear your word. Lord, we thank you for how you're obviously, evidently here. God, you are omnipresent. So while you're in the room, you're outside the walls and you're inside the walls of our heart today. God, we pray that you would have your way in us in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. You know, love is a word that we toss around pretty loosely. I mean, we, 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 we kind of use this word pretty casually, if we're honest with ourselves. We, we say stuff like, you know, I, I love my house. I love my car. We say things like, you know, I, I, I love my job. Uh, we say things like, I love pizza. <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> I love cake. I love ice cream. Or I love this movie. I love this new show. We, we speak of it very casually to refer to things that we have some emotions or, or good feelings about. Because love really speaks to our emotive connection to either people or places or things. But today I want us just to go a little deeper and and talk about some more of the biblical meaning and the depths of this word love. And in 1 John 4, 8, we, we saw and we read together this phrase, God is love. It is a self-definition. God says, you can define me. And my character by this one word, love. Because God is love. Now remember, last week we established the fact that God is eternal. So if God is love, then he's been loved forever. If God is love, he didn't, he didn't become love. He just is love, right? So, so love didn't start with you and me. Love started with God. In fact, God was love before there was a you and me to love. And that's, in and of itself, a powerful concept for us to grasp. You might remember last week we read Genesis 1, verse 1, and we just really focused in on those first four words of the holy canon of Scripture. What is it? In the beginning, God. We talked about how before there was anything, before there was any of us, before there, were, there was any uh, created matter around us, there was God. In the beginning, God. God the Father... God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Now that's why God is love and was love, because before there was any of us to love, God was love in and of himself. This is the mystery and the beauty of the Trinity. We serve a triune God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, one God, three persons wrapped in one, and so God in and of himself, there is this perfect, harmonious love relationship, three in one. And so to properly understand God's love, I think we need to also understand that that love is, is so much more than feelings, all right? It's so much more than emotions. We've all heard the phrase, I fell in love. Maybe you've said that. 
I remember when I fell in love. And, and we, we, with this type of understanding of love, if we're not careful, you know, it's kind of like we're like, I didn't see it coming. It just happened. I just, like I fell into a ditch somewhere, I fell in love. And so what can happen with this type of understanding of love? Well, if we're not careful, I think we could reduce the concept of love down to feelings. Now, this isn't to say that feelings don't matter. Of course they matter. God gave us the ability to have emotions and to have feelings. But hear me, they're only a part of love. Because if all love is is feelings and emotions, then I guess we could just as easily fall out of love. And maybe this is why... Over half of marriages are ending in divorce because love is more about a feeling. And if I feel like I can love you right now, I can. But when I feel like I'm done with you, we can just fall out of what we fell into. I love this quote from Tim Keller. He says, you don't fall into love, you commit to it. Love says, I will be there no matter what. So love is so much more than emotion. It's so much more than feelings, although it has emotion to it it's deeper than that look at how scott mcknight puts it. i love this quote he said love is not primarily emotion or affection but rather a covenant commitment to another person so so love i'm i'm trying to get you to grasp this today that love is a covenant commitment it's not a contract you know contracts are written up with terms of separation But covenant is deeper. It's commitment. It's everlasting. In fact, one of the Hebrew words for love, you might know, is the word hased. And this Hebrew word hased, we we have for years had trouble translating it into our human vocabulary and vernacular. Giving it even definition is hard because it carries so much depth to its purpose and its meaning. But the best I can do to try to describe this type of love, the hased love, when God says he's he's in commitment and covenant with us, it speaks to an everlasting attachment. This is why, you know, Paul wrote in Romans that, that, that nothing can separate us from the love of God because he's committed to us. It's a covenant attachment to us. So God's love is infinite and God's love is eternal. That's why we sing songs that say his love never gives up. It never fails. It never runs out on us. It's committed. It's steadfast. It's everlasting. Can you say amen? Amen. So then with this understanding of love, I think we need to also understand that, remember, you and I were created, formed, fashioned in the likeness and in the image of this loving God. So I think there's something to be said about how we love because because we were first loved by our Heavenly Father. The text we read earlier literally says that if someone does not love love, then that person does not know God. The idea here is that if God is love and you and I are children of a loving Father, then we should look like our Father. Like if you worked at a florist, pretty soon you're going to smell like flowers. It's going to be obvious that that your environment has changed something about you. We can see it, smell it, feel it. Something's different about you. It should be the same way in our relationship with God. As we experience this perfect, unconditional, agape love, this hased attachment, it should change the way we view love in our relationships, not only in our marriages, but in our interpersonal relationships and how we love other people. So if God is love and I'm a child of God, then I ought to look like my father. And hear me, not just in theory, but in actions. How do I live this thing out? Let's look at verse 10 again in our text today in 1 John chapter 4. It says, this is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us. Hear this, and sent his son. So there's action there. He sent his son. He did something about it as what? As an atoning sacrifice for our sins. This is love. God demonstrates it. God acts on it. It says he loved us and sent his son. How? In a self, think about this, in a self-sacrificial way. He took himself and sacrificed himself for others. Yeah, even people who would reject him, deny him, curse him, turn away from him, spit on him, crucify him, mock him. See, one of the most characteristic ways we 
can love like God is when we are self-sacrificial in the way that we deal with our relationships, people, our spouse, our children, that we give of ourselves, that we would be willing, because of God's love for us, hear me, to disadvantage ourselves for the advantage of someone else. Y'all not going to talk to me this morning. Let's go to the next verse, verse 11. Dear friends, since God so loved us, I love that it uses the word so, like John 3, 16, that he so loved us, so loved. How do you put a modifier in front of agape? I'll, I'll never have this figured out, but since he so loved us, we also ought to love one another. So it's pretty clear. Contextually, let me show you how this could also read. I'll put it in my own translation. Took the text off so you don't think I'm adding to the scripture. But this is what this could mean in context. Dear friends, since God so loved us by sacrificing himself, we also ought to love one another through self-sacrifice. Now, maybe you're wondering, okay, okay, pastor, I hear you, Pastor Daniel, but how do I do that? Well, I'm so glad you asked. I'm going to give you some practical ways. I want to give you some practical ways. We're going to get practical for just a minute here on how we can give love the way God gives love to us, self-sacrificially. Because this is what true godly love looks like. True love gives. True love sacrifices. So I'm going to give you three ways today you can love self-sacrificially. The first one is this. Sacrifice your time. Sacrifice your time. I'm sure we've all heard the phrase in one way or another that love is a, or that time is our most precious gift or it's our most precious commodity. This is because we, we all only have a set amount of time. And by the way, whether you realize this or not, we all have the same amount of it. We may all be in the room today with different uh, amounts of money. But we all have the same amount of time. We have a set amount of time. You can make more money, but you can't make more time. So when you give someone your time, you're actually giving them a portion of your life that you will never get back. Think about that. When you give someone your time, you're giving them part of you, your life, that you can never get back. This is why one of the greatest gifts you can give someone is just your time. And I get it. We all get busy. I get it. There's probably many of us in the room that if we took a real long look at the margin in our life, we would realize that many of us are probably we're, we're overworked and overstressed and underrested. And somebody said, that's me right there. Yes, yes, Lord. He's preaching to me. We all get busy, and a lot of times we, 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 we get so busy that we, we, we tell people, like, I just don't have time, and I am guilty of this, guilty as charged. Thank you, Lord. You see me. You know, I'm being honest today, okay? I don't have enough time for that. I just, oh, you know, and I, I've been trying to do better. Lord, help me. I've been trying to do better. Like when people say, like, hey, how's it going? The first thing I say is not going to be like, well, just, you know, just busy. Just, just, just staying busy, like, like that's because we say that because let's be honest, it make that implies I'm, I'm important at some level. Or I got things to do, I got stuff going on, you know, I got a place to be and some stuff to do. So I'm just, I'm just busy. But you know what's amazing is I've been able to travel and meet pastors and CEOs and professional athletes and coaches over my years of ministry. Some of the most, some of the most successful. Or better said, some of the most effective leaders and people I've met, you, you wouldn't know that they're that busy. So they don't give off this aura that like, oh, ha, whew, ha, just so busy, just ha, ha, don't have time, don't have time for that. Oh, I wish I had time, just ha, can't find the time. And it's like, it's like if, if they don't give off that, how do we? And people say to me all the time, like, Pastor Daniel, I meant so much that you called or I meant so much that you showed up because we just know how busy you are. And I just hope that I don't ever give off that aura that I'm too busy to give time because time is all I have. Time is all I have to give to people, and I don't want to be so consumed with what I want to do and what I need that I tell people I'm just too busy. Because let's be honest, we all have the same amount of time, and we all make time for what we want to make time for. 
I don't mean to get up in anybody's Kool-Aid today, okay? But I know it, we're, probably some of us are guilty of saying, I'm sorry, I just didn't have time to come to the thing that you invited me to. But, like, you had time to go tee off at Chapel Hills, okay? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I didn't have time to do that. I, oh, man, I wanted to serve. I wanted to help. But I whew, just don't have time. But you had time to eat ice cream and binge your favorite Netflix show. Like, we, we have time for what we want to make time for. And the truth is we all make time for the things we enjoy. And so maybe, possibly, perchance, no shame, casting no shade, but maybe there are times when we say we don't have time when the reality is we had time. We just subjugated it to what we wanted to do rather than maybe what God was calling us to do. See, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm convicted by this. So what happens is, is people get asked in the church, hey, would you, would you consider serving on a serve team or serving at serve day or serving at Radiant or serving at Fall Family Festival? And what do a lot of people do if we're honest? Like, oh, yeah, well, let me, let me check my schedule. And, uh, or, or better yet, let me, let me over-spiritualize it. Let me pray about it. And what you really meant was let me forget about it. Because it's not that I don't have time. It's that I don't want to make time to even pray about what I said I was going to pray about. We lie in church. I'll pray about it. No, you ain't. I didn't mean to step on toes today. As a result, what happens? Not just our church, but churches all over America end up depending on and pulling on the same faithful 20% to serve in our ministries, to serve at our events, to serve in the community, to serve at the pantry, to serve at the medical clinic, to serve at Operation Christmas. We... we so can I just encourage somebody today, because i got to go to my next point anyway. Uh, let me encourage you, find a place to serve. Find a place to sacrifice you. Find a place to sacrifice your time, because if you're not, I promise you, you're missing out on one of the greatest joys of serving God, serving his people, giving of yourself. And the people who serve here at Chapel Hill should probably agree with me by saying Amen. Amen. Now, if you said amen and you ain't serving, okay. <laughs> Last Saturday, we had a serve day here at Chapel Hill. I want to show you some pictures where we had over 200 cars filled with families who are uh, coming here to get free food and free car wash and free medical care. They were able to get wellness checks. They were able to get dental care. They were able to get boxes of food. And look at these people serving with a smile because there is nothing like giving your time, sacrificing yourself to serve people in need. And if you've never experienced that joy, listen, this sermon ain't about getting more servant leaders in our church. This is about you getting the joy of serving. So even if you don't serve at Chapel Hill here in Douglasville, maybe you can find a place at the pantry or the care place or some other place like the Pregnancy Resource Center who are looking right now for volunteer nurses to come and serve. Just find a place to serve. Somebody say, we hear you, Pastor. All right, I can move on. I was so blessed this week. To, I went to uh, officiate a funeral, and as I arrived, there were already members from our care team there, already there. Before the pastor doing the sermon even got there, they were already there to greet the family, to pray with the family, to comfort the family. Why? Why did they give up their time? Why did they give up their lunch break to go to a funeral 30 minutes away from their job and miss out on having lunch? Because they found the value and the joy of giving themselves to people in need. The second one is sacrifice your treasure. Sacrifice your treasure. Matthew 6.21 says this, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So our treasure should be, hopefully, it's rooted in Christ. That's where our heart is. That's where our treasure should be. This is why our earthly treasures should be used, I believe, to further his kingdom. This is why here at Chapel Hill we have a value of generosity. If you go on our website and click on our values, you're going to see that we have a value of generosity. So what does that mean? Well, practically speaking, obviously we, we believe in bringing the tithe into the storehouse and giving 10% to God as the tithe. And that's part of how we worship him and we trust him. But also we talk often about going over and above the tithe and giving what we call kingdom builders giving. And that 
type of generosity is beyond our walls. The majority of all of that we give to missionaries, we give to projects, we give to building churches, we give in foreign lands and countries all over the world. Over 150 missionaries that we're supporting, not including different projects and sex trafficking projects and projects for people who are saying yes to going on a mission field in a place that is dangerous to preach the gospel and they sell everything to move and go away and they're hoping that churches like us would make a commitment financially and say hey we're going to be a part of what God is doing and maybe you're like me and you wish you could go on the mission field more and you wish you could travel around the world and preach the gospel and serve people more and you cannot but you can through kingdom builders because when you sow sacrificially and over and above giving you are sacrificing your treasure in a way that it will store up treasures in heaven if you believe that say amen the third way is sacrifice your talent. And this is not the least of these, but this is something that we should all just consider. This, this can go hand in hand with our time, of course, but there's something about sacrificing the gifts God has given me, the gifts God has given you. Every one of us in this room have talents and gifts, and some of us leverage that for our salary and our job and the things that we do as a profession. Some of us just use our gifts as a, a hobby or as a joy that we have. But hear me, these talents are gifts for God, from God to us, and, and yes, you may practice and you may hone your thing and you may get better and you may get trained and, and all of that, but God gave you the, the raw materials called skill and gifting and talent. And let me show you some more pictures today of a Brazil go trip. We just had a team of young adults led by Christelle. You can see her there in the middle. And Jonah, they led some of our young adults to go to Brazil to minister. And they're they using their gifts to lead them in worship, using their gift, the gift of prayer, the gift of serving those in need. They went to remote villages like this and met people who have nothing but a hammock and who are broken and who are literally on the last leg of their life. We had people, some of our young adults in the back behind these kids serving them, using their gifts and their talents to teach them music and worship and drama. And, and we, we saw the gifts and the talents help people hear the gospel. And if you've never considered the stuff that you have the gifts, the talents, the, the literal spiritual stuffing that God put in you. The stuff that he wants to then um, cultivate from your life to serve others. I encourage you, consider that. Uh, at Radiant on Friday night, we had um, an incredible guest speaker, Tony Collier, and she at the altar call just prophetically saw a lady, and she pointed her out, and she said, there is something on your life. It's a gift, and it's a talent that God is using in the marketplace, and God wants you to use it for ministry. And she said, um, I know that was the Lord speaking, so does that make sense? And her friend was like, yes, yes, it does. Yes, you better, you better tell her. And I just was reminded in that moment that God really wants all of us to think that way. What do I have in my hand like Moses that God says, what do you already have? Don't wait for me to give you an opportunity. Who, how have I made you, formed you, fashioned you, the gifts I've given you? How can you use that to glorify me and to serve my church and to serve those who are beyond the walls of the church? This is important for us to understand that love gives. Love sacrifices. See, you can give without loving, but you cannot love without giving. I'll say that again. You can give without loving, but you cannot love without giving. When you love, you can't help but give. You got to get, so, so parents, let me just say this, that, that this doesn't just mean like you buy your kids a, a, a PS5 to show that you love them. Okay, some of the, some of the you know, the, the, the youth would probably be really happy I said that, you know, that you, it'd be a good idea for you to give them a PS5, but that's not what I'm saying. It's not, it's, love isn't you giving them a new pair of shoes or giving them a new video game. It's, it's more than that. that. Love can be expressed through gifts, but love is really about you giving you. So we love our children by giving them sometimes direction, and sometimes we love them by giving them discipline. Can I get an amen? amen. If I really love my son, if I really love my daughter, if I really love them, then there are times where I have to discipline them, not because I want them to be punished, but because I want them to have the, the, the correction and the direction that God wants for their life so they don't keep making the same mistakes. So that's love. Love is giving myself. It's when you really love, you give you. You pour out you. It says, for God so loved the world that he gave what? Himself. He self-sacrificed. He gave himself. He didn't give some of himself. He gave 
all of himself. God gave everything he had in Jesus Christ. Jesus came to become our substitute. He came to die in our place, to pay our price. He went on that cross to become a ransom for our sin, to become a substitute. He went to the cross and he poured out everything for you and for me. Can you give God praise for that? He was his only begotten son. I, I feel like preaching this today. He was God's only begotten son. You know, in Genesis 22, it uses that same phrase, only begotten son, when it talks about Abraham sacrificing Isaac, which was a type and a shadow of, of God sacrificing his only begotten son. And I found out that that phrase, only begotten son, can literally be translated as, as a uniquely born son. And this makes sense because, you know, Abraham and Sarah were in their 90s and had a child. That's uniquely born. Okay? Think about that. One was 90, the other was 99, and they had a kid. Think about that. Not too long, just for a minute. Uniquely born son. And Jesus, only begotten, is also God's uniquely born son. Son, why? Because Mary was a virgin. And Mary got pregnant not by a man, but by the Holy Spirit. See, Jesus could not have an earthly father because if he had an earthly father, he would have a sin nature. And if he had a sin nature, he wouldn't be worthy to die for my sins. So he's uniquely born because he was born of a virgin. And him being uniquely born, the only begotten son, makes him qualified to be my and your redeemer. See, cherubim couldn't do it. Seraphim couldn't do it. Abraham couldn't do it because Abraham, you know, he, he lied and he said that Sarah was his sister. Jacob couldn't do it because Jacob lied too and stole his brother's birthright. Noah couldn't do it because he messed around and got drunk after the flood. Moses couldn't do it because he was frustrated with God's people. David, by the way, couldn't do it either because he took another man's wife for his own, took her to bed. See, see, there had to be a sinless substitute. And the only one qualified in the history of the world was Jesus, the Messiah. And hear me today. Jesus is the same Savior today. He is the full expression of God's love. And there is salvation in that name. There is power in that name. There is joy and peace and hope in that name somebody who believes in Jesus just shout amen the Bible says in Romans but God demonstrates his own love for us in this what that while we were yet sinners Christ died for us oh this is what love looks like not after I got better not after I improved not after I got saved not after I made him some promises not after I got a little bit improved in this area of my life where I'm lacking not after I laid down some sins not after I got rid of some habits God loved me while I was yet in sin in my muck and my my mire, he set my feet upon a rock. He rescued me out of my wicked state. I wish I could get a witness at church today. Christ died for me while I was still in my sin state. He went to the cross and he paid the price. God loved you and he demonstrated that love before you ever chose him. He chose you. The Bible says in Revelation, it says this. Let your mind grasp this. When we talk about an eternal God, this is what Revelation says. It says the lamb was slain from the foundation of the world. So that means in eternity, Christ was crucified before Mary even got pregnant. God already had a plan. The enemy thought he was going to have his way. But how many of you know God is a planner? God is a strategizer. God already had a plan before the devil did anything. God already had a substitute, just like when Abraham went up on that side of that mountain. And he got up there, he said he looked over and saw a ram caught in the bush. You know what that tells me? The whole time Abraham was walking up this side of the mountain, he didn't see it. But there was a substitute walking up this side of the mountain. And so when he got there, God said, I already had provision. How many of you are thankful he made a way out of no way? How many of you are thankful he, prayed that he paid the price I couldn't pay? This is love at the full expression. 
Love gives. Love sacrifices. And John 3.16 is where I want to close today. It says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever, who? Whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Woo. The love of God is unfathomable. A child can memorize John 3.16 and yet scholars and theologians are still trying to plummet its depths. God gave his one and only begotten son that whoever, the crackhead, the prostitute, the drug addict, the alcoholic, the sinner, he gave him, he gave himself. See, the Greeks had three words that they primarily used for this word love. One is the word eros, which is where we get the word erotic from in the English this type of love, eros love, is not mentioned anywhere in the New Testament. This is amazing because eros is all about taking. It is not about giving. It's all about getting something without giving anything in return. It's all about the self. And then there is this word, the second Greek word, phileo. Phileo is where we get the word Philadelphia, which is where we get the idea of brotherly or the city of brotherly love and this is about our relationships with one another with each other with our brothers with our sisters this is friendship type of love and the love mentioned here in the text in John three sixteen, is not eros it's not phileo but it is agape and agape love has nothing to do with the person being loved and it has everything to do with the lover Agape is not about the person being loved. Because the person being loved may be totally unworthy of that love. The love of God has nothing to do with the object of his love. But the love of God, hear me folks, is based on the character and the nature of who God is. There's nothing we can do to earn it. There's nothing we can do to deserve it. God just gives it. I'm so thankful for this. Because while I'm unworthy, he still loves me. I was unlovely, but he still loves me. I was lost, but he still loves me. I was broken, but he still loves me. He loves me. Every head bowed, every eye closed. There is agape in the room today. The Father's love is here today. And if you're here and you don't have a relationship with Jesus, I just want to take this moment to encourage you to open up your heart and allow the love of God to infiltrate every part of who you are. Father, I just want to thank you right now for your perfect, unconditional love. And Lord, I'm praying, God, that right now that anyone within the sound of my voice, whether in the room or online, that needs a relationship with Jesus, Lord, I pray, God, that right now they would have wide open hearts to receive this perfect, unconditional, agape love. If you're here today and you don't know him like that, if you've never experienced this kind of love, this agape, this unconditional love, I want to encourage you right now to open up your heart and give him your full undivided attention and allow God to minister to you. Lord, I thank you for agape. I thank you for unconditional love. Lord, I thank you for who you are. With heads bowed and eyes closed, if you need him today, would you just say, God, I receive your love. Lord, thank you that you gave yourself to me. You gave Jesus to me. And Lord, right now, I pray in the name of Jesus, would you have your way in this place? And God, if there's anyone here within the sound of my voice that doesn't know you, I pray that they would repent right now. Turn from their sin, turn from their selfish ways, and receive this self-sacrificial love. If you're here today and you don't know him, maybe you've never prayed a prayer to give your life to Jesus. Or maybe you have before, but if you're honest, you've backslidden, you've, you've turned and you've gone the other way so many times. Or maybe you've just stopped moving forward towards him. And today you want to repent and you want to make a fresh commitment. Listen, God is waiting on that. Why? Because he made a commitment to you. And he would love nothing more than for you to reciprocate that and turn back toward him. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. If you want to receive this love, you can pray this prayer after me. Not 
not after me, but actually, not with me, but after me. And I want to encourage all of our church family here. Let's pray this prayer out loud with anyone who may be praying it for the first time. And before we do, if you're in the room, heads are still bowed, eyes are still closed, but you say, I, I want to let you know who you're praying for, Pastor Daniel. Would you just lift up a hand and say, that's me? One, two, three. Quickly, hands are going up. You're saying, that's me. Hands are going up around the room, front, back, side to side. Yeah, I see those hands in the back. Yeah, keep that hand up. You're saying, Lord, it's me. It's me. I, I want this. I, I want this. Hands are down. Let's pray this prayer out loud. Come on, church family, help me pray. Say, Lord Jesus, today I'm committed to you because you're committed to me. Thank you for your love. Thank you for agape, that you loved me before I ever chose you. Lord, I give you my life. I give you my family, my future, my everything. It's in your hands. I believe that you died and rose again to give me salvation and to give me life. In Jesus' name we pray. Say amen. The Bible says if one sinner repents, heaven rejoices. Come on, let's rejoice right there. <laughs> Hallelujah. We're going to take Holy Communion together. If you're in the room, if you're watching online, you can grab some elements. If you're in the room, you should have gotten elements when you came through the door. If you happen to slide by our hosts and didn't get them, we have tables in the front here. You can go ahead and feel free to grab those. We have tables in the middle of our room and tables in the back of our auditorium as well. You can feel free to grab those. I'm going to read some scripture, and then we're going to take the elements together. Matthew 26, 26 through 28. It says, while they were eating, Jesus took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body. Then he took a cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is the blood of my covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Would you take the bread? When I take the bread, I, I like to break it. Because to me, it symbolizes the brokenness of his body. And one way this is significant today, as we remember what he did, the price that he paid, if you're sick, physically, emotionally, mentally, if you're sick and you need to be healed, if something's broken or bent out of shape in your life, I'm reminded of the words of Jesus many times when he would heal the sick. He wouldn't just say, your faith has healed you. He would say, your faith has made you whole. So Lord, I thank you for wholeness today. I thank you that through your bruised, broken body, we can believe for healing right now. In Jesus' name, let's take the bread. Thank you, Lord. In the same way, he took the cup, he gave thanks, and he gave it to them saying, drink from it, all of you, my disciples, my followers, because this represents the blood of the covenant, which is poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Lord, today we take the cup. Lord, we remember what you did, the price you paid. You truly poured out you. You poured out your love for us so that we could be made right in the eyes of a holy God. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Let's take the cup. After you take the cup, would you just stand and worship today? Thank you, Jesus. Let's thank him. And thank you, Jesus, for the blood applied. Thank you, Jesus, it has washed me white. Thank you, Jesus, you have saved my life. You brought me from the darkness into glory. Again. Thank you, Jesus. Thank 